What you're about to hear is an interview that I had with legendary software developer, race car driver, business owner, David Hannemeyer Hansen. We talk about SQLite in the beginning, and then we talk about stoicism and conceptual compression and the one person framework. We talk, we talk about it all. If you want to learn more about SQLite, I am creating a course, highperformancesqlite.com, and you can find everything you need to know about SQLite there. Enough about me, let's roll the interview. I tweeted at you like an hour ago, and and here and here we are. Um, so I I tweeted at you because I saw Daniel Vasallo talking about their instance of campfire, and I'm I'm a member of his community, and so um, and I saw that he was running stuff in the SQL SQLite command line, and I was like, yeah, I should do this now. It's been on my list. I'm just gonna tweet at him, and I said, hey, DHH, do you want to talk about this? And you're like, yeah, let's do it today. So here we are. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. This is one of the advantages of having a mostly empty calendar. You can do things when they pop up. So yep. I'm really excited about SQLite, so I love talking about uh, things that I'm excited about. So let's talk about it. Uh, so speaking of, before we dive in, your video looks amazing. Your audio sounds amazing. Is this your new Linux piece together machine that is just working perfectly? This is my Linux machine. I will credit, though, my uh, Shure microphone and my Sony camera. Those two okay. things just pluck right in, especially that Sony camera. No drivers, no nothing, just USB-C straight in, and it pops up as a, as a webcam in any OS I run it on. But this is running on Linux, and it is kind of amazing. It just works. It just works. Well, that's, that's wonderful. So speaking of just works, SQLite, it's good now. It's been good maybe forever, but now we're all discovering it again. You know, the guy wrote it in, in the year 2000, and we're finally discovering it. So the reason I wanted to talk to you is because y'all did this big, you know, once.com, like, hey, we're changing everything again. And the first product that came out was Campfire, and Campfire ships with SQLite. And so I kind of want to hear about a little bit of the behind the scenes of how you ended up making that decision and kind of what some of the ramifications have been from there. Sure. So I think it, what's really interesting about SQLite is, as you say, it's been around forever and it's had its niche. This was a kind of database you would insert into a um, standalone application that would just run for one user. And that was sort of the niche it's owned for a long time. People have used it for a bunch of other things, but I think a lot of developers had that in mind. Unless I'm developing a client application that's just for one user, SQLite is not for me because you can't use it on multiple machines at the same time, yada, yada. And then what happens is computers get really fast and they get really wide in the sense that they now have a lot of cores and the SSD drives are fantastically fast and all of a sudden the preconditions for using SQLite for more than just one user are there. Again, I'm sure people were able to do this in the past, but now it feels more accessible in a way that just kind of intersected exactly at the right moment for us with once. Mm -hmm. So once is run SaaS essentially run web software, but on your own machine. And that sets it up in a environment where it's not single user, it's multi-user, that's the whole point here. You're not gonna chat with yourself, you're gonna chat with other people, but it's single tenant. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really the switching point that as I've observed it with SQLite, is that there's a bunch of web software that now makes more sense, could make sense, as single tenant software that you run on your own machine. That's obviously what we're trying to explore with once. Then there's another path of this that I think is also interesting, which is to use SQLite in the beginning of even a multi-tenancy mm. setup, just to get rid of a bunch of complexity, maybe get rid of a bunch of cost. We can talk about those two things. But when we set out to do once, we had a bunch of things that were unknowns. First of all, how are we going to get this on people's machines? My God, do they need a special machine? And then we dug into Docker and we're like, oh, actually, this fits really nicely. If we just build a bit of tooling around it, if we build an auto updater, that's sort of like if you're auto updating your operating system or a single user uh, application on your machine. Okay, that kind of works, but what do we do about the database? Oh shit, do we have to now run a second Docker image that then runs MySQL or Postgres? What if it gets wedged? Um, there's just a bunch more moving parts. And what we were really trying hard to do with once was to make this so simple that it kind of couldn't break, 
Because if it was going to break, people were going to write us in, and the business model of once just wasn't designed to support that. We sell Campfire yeah. for $399, one-time cost. There's not a lot of, uh, not a lot of room, in, room in that. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, for someone to go like, can you help me debug my mm-hmm. Postgres instance? Mm, no, I, I can't help you with that. So... I was really gung-ho about the idea that we were going to just take out moving parts. How can we take out more moving parts, more moving parts? How can we simplify this so much that it's a single Docker image? And if it somehow gets wedged, you just restart it. Mm-hmm. And there's no dependencies. There's no Docker Compose. There's no any of these other things. And SQLite, of course, just fits beautifully with that. So we started exploring it early on, and we almost abandoned it. <laughs> really? <laughs> because we dug in. And especially at the time, I think we weren't versed in SQLite. There's mm-hmm. some defaults in the SQLite database mm-hmm. that are suited for its historical purpose that mm-hmm. isn't so well suited for web applications. One of, one of its great strengths is its great weakness. It's extremely backwards compatible, and the defaults are kind of bad now. So, yeah. Yes. At least they're not suited for multi-user web mm-hmm. software. Um, that uh, wall is not turned on mm-hmm. by default and there's a handful of other things you got to turn on by default. So first we had to find what those things were. And that's what's so interesting about what's going on with SQLite. The general awareness of what's required to use that database for the kind of stuff we're using it for is just spreading like wildfire. Like mm-hmm. literally one year ago, I was trying to figure things out. Like, how do we do this? There wasn't that much information about that specific use case. And now there's so much more information mm-hmm. and it's, it's expanding and we're trying to change, um, and not just trying, we have changed Rails already to make it such that the SQLite you get out of the box is configured in the right mm-hmm. way, in the way that works very well for, for website up. So anyway, we had to go through that. And then we ran a bunch of uh, performance tests on it. And we found that there were a handful of things that we had to tweak. These were things around um, long-running transactions. Mm -hmm. A few other things were the standard, to be honest, inefficient way of doing things sometimes in Rails. Um, Bit in a way with uh, SQLite that wouldn't have bit with MySQL. Mm -hmm. Because especially on the transaction thing, you really don't want to do, you really never should. But um, you don't want to do a lot of uh, computation inside of your transactions. You don't mm-hmm. want to do a lot of callbacks. You don't want to do anything that really takes a lot of time because as soon as someone goes like, I want to have a transaction and it's for right, there's contention, right? There's one yep. file and, and we got to do all this uh, stuff. That's where SQLite's limitations come in. But mm-hmm. they really aren't that big of limitations if you just flip your thinking a little bit. And to give you a specific example, in Rails... Um, we have something called callbacks, where mm-hmm. when a new uh, model is being saved, it can call back, and then it can do a bunch of work. And that callback happens inside the transaction you're being creating in. So if you go back and you do a bunch of stuff in that transaction where you're pulling things um, from the database and maybe you're working on it a little bit, and then you go back, that's a long-running transaction mm-hmm. in the SQL-like sense of it. It doesn't doesn't usually matter with, with MySQL or Postgres. You don't notice those things. But we switched a handful of invocations that were written in that naive style to use insert all, Hmm. which is a not new, but relatively recently, certainly recently refined API for doing bulk operations with Active Record, the um, object relational mapper we have in Rails, Mm -hmm. where everything just happens in one execution. Right? Like we're not fetching a bunch of um, objects and we're not asking them to fetch data and then write the data. It's just very efficient. Mm-hmm. And so we, we had to find what those points were. And we found them basically by stress testing the whole thing. We set up this whole rig to simulate what's going to happen if you have 10,000 users on one box and they're all trying to chat at the same time. Where is the contention? Um, and it took, I don't know how long it took. It didn't take that long to figure out, okay, here are the hotspots. Here's what we got to do with those hotspots. Now that we know what those hotspots are and we've um, identified them, SQLite is no longer actually the uh, bottleneck. It ended up being other things that were the bottleneck, like WebSocket connections, stampedes, those kind of things. But we ended up in a situation which was kind of the dream situation where we could imagine a very active chat instance with 10,000 users on single box. So now we had 
a envelope where we could go from, I think our minimum requirements is like one vCPU, two gigabytes of RAM, that'll support, I think, 500 chatters simultaneously, or something like that. These are quite... Um, aggressively low uh, benchmark numbers because we were saying like, each chatter is someone who says something in a room every second, which that's not how it is for most chatters, right? Yeah. But anyway, so we can go from that on, on like a cloud VM droplet style thing and then all the way up to you can run the same piece of software for 10,000 users on a single box because that is the constraint, Right. SQLite enforces the constraint on you. This is going to run on a single box. You're mm -hmm. not going to have mm -hmm. five application servers that are all trying to access this one file. That doesn't work. But where we've gone from with SQLite is 10 years ago, how, how many users could we get on one box at an affordable, not exotic hardware kind of level? I don't know what that number was, but it was a lot less than 10,000. I'll tell you that. I mean, just the number of cores you have access to and, and all these other hardware advancements weren't present. So some of the rediscovery of SQLite is that the future has caught up with what it's capable of doing. It's allowed its envelope to be so much larger because computers are so much faster. And that's one of those things I find so fascinating. And we've explored this domain with other things we've done, uh, solid queue and solid cache, which now instead of using RAM for uh, uh, job management and for caching, it uses SSDs because some of the fundamentals have changed. Like, what was the speed of storage 10 years ago versus what is the speed of storage now? A lot of technologies, I think, are not keeping up with some of these things that actually do change, but they change sort of gradually, and then suddenly there's a new capability drop hmm. where you can go, oh, SQLite works in production, works on a real system where people are chatting on, with thousands of concurrent uh, chatters. Um, that's kind of amazing. It's amazing that we can use the progress of technology to simplify the stack. Now, mm -hmm. I like MySQL a lot. I've been using MySQL for literally 25 years. It's a great database. It works very well for hey, it works very well for Basecamp. These are very large systems where we have a massive amounts of application surfaces. So that's fine. That's, that's still there. No one's taking that away. But we're now being gifted this opportunity that one style software, single tenant software, early stage software can run on SQLite and have essentially no apologies about it. I feel like a lot of your a lot of your career has been really focused on like eliminating complexity, especially needless complexity. Um, I don't want to talk about TypeScript, but we could talk about TypeScript. <laughs> but eliminating complexity, you've got this concept of like um, conceptual compression. And I feel like SQLite has kind of fit into the DHH world and the and the, the narratives that you have throughout your whole career, but especially right now with the cloud exit as well, because you can imagine, hey, you buy this software, but make sure you sign up with some cloud hosted database provider. And it's like, oh, well, shoot, that's kind of against the point. And so I feel yes. like this all kind of happened in stream with your current and historic like thought processes. And it just removes this entire piece of complexity from the stack. Did that like, did that light you up inside to, to be like, it's just a file. There's no, there's, it's just a file. It, no, it's amazing. And it's amazing for exactly the reason you say. It's the compe uh, conceptual compression of what even is a database? Mm -hmm. How much do I need to think about this thing? I mean, if you're setting up and you're running a daemon, a long running process that has to be fed and tendered to and cared for, that is, that's just got to fit inside your brain. Like that's a bubble mm -hmm. in here, right? And that bubble, whether it's large or small, it takes up room. SQLite does not take up room in the same way. Again, there's a couple of things you got to know, and you got to set some things up, and they're da da da. But on an operational ba uh, data uh, basis, there's just a lot less to think about because it is just this file. A lot of things that are um, complicated or required more learning or skill to operate these. I was about to call them historic databases. That sounds like <laughs> that's not what it is. But these um, traditional Mm -hmm. SQL database. Let's just call them that. It's just, um, it's wonderful to be able to pop that balloon. And then, of course, on top of that, there are just use cases like we have with once where it's just like a perfect fit. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Like we're giving software to, for, to other people to run. They have to run it on their own machines. They, it just can't have the moving parts because if one of the parts breaks, as we've talked about, that's going to be a support burden. And then the model doesn't work. So I'd actually say SQLite is one of the supporting pillars of why we're able to do something like once. Hmm. Another supporting pillar is Docker, that we've been able to take whole systems and put them into a single mm-hmm. uh, container, and now you can run those. There's a bunch of factors where I would not have attempted once like 10, 15 years ago. I remember talking to the GitHub crew when they were doing GitHub Enterprise in the early days. And <laughs> I took one look at what that required back in the day before Docker, before SQLite, before all these other things. And I just thought like, wow, that's a lot of work to be able to have a piece of so- web software that you install on, on customers' own computers. Mm-hmm. I wish it wasn't so hard, but mm, we're not going to touch that. And we, it's actually something we've been asked for countless times um, over the years. In fact, even the White House at one point, I think when Obama just got elected, uh, someone from the White House reached out, oh, we've been using Basecamp for this, that, and the other thing. Can we run it inside the White House? And it was one of those things where, like, that's a very patriotic thing mm-hmm. to do. Let's um, support our government and let them run our software. And we just had to say, no, I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> we can't do that because we're just not set up to do that. So yeah. it really came at a great time for once. And I also think it comes at a great time for the industry. I think mm-hmm. we, we were sort of being pulled in both these directions where, on the one hand, the web, in terms of its complex or um, conceptual complexity, is getting worse. Like it's getting more complicated. There are ever more things you could know about, dive into, become an expert at. It's daunting. Yet at the same time, we also have these fundamental improvements in the underlying technology where you have to know nothing to reap the benefits. Hmm. SQLite, as sort of chaperoned by faster hardware, more cores, SSDs is one example of that. Mm-hmm. Another example, of course, I've been um, hugely a fan of is no build. This idea mm-hmm. that browsers themselves have gotten incredibly good. Just in the last three years, browsers have just taken huge bites out of the complexity that's involved with front-end development. And we're still sort of I don't know, catching up to that, Um, Mm -hmm. some faster than others, or or some more willingly than others, perhaps Mm -hmm. you could say. I'm very willing to let, for example, a browser engine uh, eat some of the complexity that I've been used to dealing with on the front end. And I'm very happy to see that uh, faster SSDs and more cores is eating up the complexity that is involved running a database. And all of these things are coming together at the same time, and they must. They literally must, because if these things are not enabling us to compress the complexity, heads are just going to explode. Mm-hmm. Or building for the web will no longer be feasible for the individual developer. And that to me is, I will stand on that barricade until the last straw, the last yep. fight, the last boss battle of complexity here. We cannot give up on the internet being something that individual developers can build for and be competitive on. I've built literally the entire business we have at 37 Signals from Basecamp forward on that premise that I, as a single developer, could know enough about enough things to be competitive with the biggest companies in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that is more than ever just crucial that we don't hand over the internet to a handful of super conglomerates who can have these supersized teams and can have these very thinly sliced specialties where like, oh, I am a front-end framework engineer something something and I will be one of 19 other slices to create this one product. Mm -hmm. Um, inside a big company. And I think, unfortunately, and this is what's so interesting, SQLite is obviously open source. Um, A lot of these other tools that we're using are open source, but even within open source, there's a bit of a battle where a lot of open source software is coming from large companies. Mm -hmm. And that's great in some sense, right? Like we want large companies to give back and we want them to contribute to the ecosystem. But what can also happen is that their frame of mind, their viewpoint is contributed with it, and Mm -hmm. we end up in a place where we actually don't really want to be on closer reflection. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about SQLite 2. I think the team behind it is something like three or four people, and they don't even take outside contribution. (laughs) And they've been working on it for like 20 years. And I'm like, 
amazing amazing uh-huh. that something like that not only is is feasible but to me is sort of a high watermark bar for like mm-hmm. one kind of development i mean rails is of course is not that i mean we have 6,000 contributors yeah. or 7,000 maybe at this point. It's a very different kind of things. But I love the fact that something like SQLite can be so good, so universally recognized, and it's literally the work of like three or four people. Hey, I hope you're enjoying this. Just as a reminder, you can learn more about SQLite at highperformancesqlite.com. I'll get out of your way. Back to the interview. It it is wild, and if you read if you read through the documentation, the doc the docs are written by I assume the one guy D Richard Hip. Uh, he goes by initials as well, so you'll have that in common. You also have in common that he writes his docs with like a point of view, like they're they're funny and they're conversational and they're engaging, and especially when you get to the um, when you get to the section about uh, types and how how SQLite is just like. Now, whatever you want to put in here, we'll take. We'll, we'll take. we'll take anything you want to put in here. And at the very bottom, he's like, we have introduced strict tables. Basically, like, if you're into that kind of thing. It's kind of like the, the tone that he, he puts in there. And so I do, I do really appreciate, um, I, think it's, I think it is three guys. So I appreciate their, like, dedication to it. It's the, it's the archival format of the Library of Congress, for goodness sakes. So, and they're like... They have committed to supporting it through 2050, and I imagine they'll reach 2050 and be like, "Oh, we're not actually going to give up. We just, you know, we just thought right. that was far away, so we said that." Um, What's so amazing about that story to me is it's such a beautiful counterpoint to this hysteria that open source is in a great crisis and that the whole internet rests on like three dudes and that's somehow terrible. No, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. We should be so lucky to have such dedication that literally three guys can form the basis of something that's used by billions of devices around mm-hmm. the world. Like, that's not a flaw. That is no. a celebration of human creativity, ingenuity, um, carrying the meaningful burden, all of these other things. And I, I love that, at least in my head, as the counterpoint to this hysteria. They're like, oh, open source is in such a crisis. What open source needs is just like more and more money, bigger, bigger mm-hmm. teams. No, they don't. They need, we need less. We need less. And SQLite is, to me, sort of on the pedestal of that, of, of that example of like, would SQLite be better if somehow Microsoft gave them 20 developers to add to that team, to add a bunch more features and do it? No, no it, wouldn't. it would be worse. It would be worse. And not because of Microsoft, but just because of the dynamics of that. Some pieces of software... And I'm thinking about another piece of software right now, Redis, mm. who for a very long time was also run by one dude. Yep. Um, who Until it wasn't. The and then what happened? And then what happened? <laughs> he stood the line and then he went off the barricades and other folks took over. And yep. then that went in some other direction that I'm not particularly fond of. Right. Mm-hmm. I go like, I hope the SQLite crew never does that. They seem extremely principled, so I, I doubt at this point, you know, 24 years after, I, I doubt they're going to, you know, sell it off to Microsoft at this point. And one of the, like, you talk about the single-person framework. I think you, you know, you had a keynote recently and a big slide that was like the one-person framework. Um, there's something pure about that, and I find that in, in SQLite too. One of the quotes from the creator is, if I had known that you're not supposed to write your own database i wouldn't have i I wouldn't have written it but i i didn't know that like i didn't i didn't ask any experts i didn't know you weren't supposed to do this thing i just had a need and a curiosity and i just i just wrote it myself and that feels that feels like that feels old school to me and i'm curious from your point of view maybe stepping just a, a half step outside of sqlite you've talked about sqlite and browsers and docker and the one person framework like what what do you see coming for the one or two person team that's like, hey, I want to I want to run my own SaaS. You know, you talked for a long time about there's a million Italian restaurants. You don't have to take over the world. You just need a little thing yep. to. So yep. like what it, what do you see? You know, I guess y'all are executing a little bit on that on once like you're having a little fun doing the, the two man thing again. But like, what do you see for the individual out there with these new capabilities coming online and where should they be looking um, if they want to create their own little Italian restaurant on the Internet? They have to control complexity. Complexity mm. is the thing that will eat you up and spit you out when you are a small team. You can't 
do all the things. You can't have all of these um, moving parts because they all need oiling. They all need tender. They all need maintenance. You need to reduce, 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 reduce. And this is why um, SQLite excites me so much. I mean, talk about no moving parts. They're mm-hmm. literally just a, just a file. I was going to say one file, but at these days it is three files when uh-huh. you run it and with the wall and so on. But yeah. it's three files. It's not a big thing. That's beautiful. To me, no build has that same quality, right? Mm. What if you just wrote JavaScript like a cave person into a text file and that text file was sent straight to the browser and that was it? And if you came back like a year later and you opened up that text file and wanted to add something to it, no and dependencies. It, still worked. <laughs> out of, it would work. It would literally work. And that's the beauty of the internet. If you were disciplined in like 1995 about how you build things, it would still run today. Like literally 30 years later, it would still run today. And then you look at what is considered perhaps in some circles the best practice way of setting things up, and it won't run in five minutes, Mm -hmm. let alone three months. Inconceivable that it will run in a year from now because it has just atrophied through the dependency churn and like all of these things. And I've um, invested in a handful of uh, startups in Denmark, and I, I see some of it there where I go like, you're a tiny team, you know. That's not the thing you should be running. Mm -hmm. That's not the thing you should be spending your time on. You should be spending your time on, as a single or tiny team of developers, uh, creating value, which really, I actually hate that word. (laughs) You should be spending your time programming features that your customers will care about. Yes. Right, like that is the thing that's going to set you apart. You're going to have a very different velocity than some big honking corporation, even than 37 signals. Like, we move substantially slower now than we did at four people. We can do more things at a different scale and with more users and so on. But if a dedicated team comes in and picks very simple tools and they operate in a box of three, four people and they commit to the simplicity of that, they're going to run circles around almost anyone. Um, again, not on all the parameters. This is the whole blue ocean strategy thing mm-hmm. where you, you pick the things you're going to be better at, but if you pick the things of we're going to double down on simplicity, we're going to double down on some tools that don't constantly churn over, it's incredible what you're capable of doing. And this is the great mm, sort of two-way split, which way Western man, <laughs> where on the one hand, you have the path that says it's never been better. Mm -hmm. Browsers have never been more capable. The basic tools have never been more amazing. Ruby, to take just one example I care about, has never run faster. Mm -hmm. The language itself has just gotten three times faster since Ruby 2 is running on computers that are literally orders of magnitude faster than when I did it on a single box in 2004 and was able to build Basecamp off that, right? So the capacity and the capabilities that you have today are just mind-boggling. But then the second road goes like, oh, what if we took all those spoils and just squandered it on casinos and pokers and blackjack and nonsense? And you end up in this way where you're like, no, you took all the spoils and you feathered them away. There was nothing left in the end that most users care about. And this Mm -hmm. is one of those great, I mean, I get into, I was going to say fights, but let's just use a polite (laughs) word, debates. Mm -hmm. on Twitter and the internet often. And sometimes it'll be about these topics of simplicity. And some folks will point out um, like, oh, you're running no build on your front end. That means you have 100 files. Like, this is going to be terrible. and It's going to be slow. And I'm just like, no. If it's fast for the user, that means you factor in all the things and the download and the this and the that and so on. They're not going to care. You're going to care. I'm going to care because simplicity for me is the enabling factor that allows me to do all the other things I care about, like running uh, feature teams with two people. That's the kind of stuff that I care about. If, if the output of that is so good that the majority of folks don't notice the difference or if they notice the difference, they don't value it in a way where they're going to pick one thing or the other. I'm not talking about like, let's go back to the Stone Age and we're going to build everything like Craigslist. Although Craigslist, Although. I will actually say, is an example <laughs> of the amazing resilience of literally not changing something since yep. 1995, right? Like it looks identical almost. Mm-hmm. And for the kind of people I've met who use Craigslist, I've never heard someone say like, I wish it had a purple gradient. Mm-hmm. Like or, that a loading, was, or a loading skeleton. <laughs> or a loading skeleton or any of these other things, right? So I think a lot of this... 
uh, anguish and existential dread certain quarters of the web development in particular feel. It's all self-inflicted. Mm. That doesn't mean it's easy to route around, but it, is, mm -hmm. it does mean at some fundamental level it is optional. Now, contrast that to developing mobile applications for iOS, for example. Mm -hmm. There's just a tool chain and a setup and a machinery and framework that you're handed to you. And I mean, you can question it. Good luck with that. You're going to take what you're given and mm -hmm. you're going to have to build something with that. And you don't have a lot of choice in the matter. The web is so freaking amazing because whether you want Postgres or MySQL or Mongo or SQLite, mm -hmm. no one is any wiser. It all gets compiled down to a, H a piece of HTML that's sent off to the user. And if that piece of HTML is fast enough, well-designed, solves an interesting problem, yep. they will clap in their little hands and pull out their credit card from their wallet and slap it down on your form. Mm -hmm. That is so amazing <laughs> and so unique in literally the history of computing and certainly the history of computing as it is today, that it just blows my mind on a regular basis how little appreciation there is for that fact and how little we collectively do to embrace that. How awesome is it that you can write Ruby, you can write Python, you can write Go, you can write Elixir, you can write JavaScript, you can all these things. PHP. You can connect it to SQLite, you can connect it to MySQL, you can connect. Yeah. There's literally a trillion permutations of how this stack can be. Um, and some people look at that and go like, that's awful. Oh, it would be so much better if there was just one dictator at the top, maybe um, St. Uh, Tom Cook here, that could just decide what should be right for everyone and if we should no 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 absolutely not the amazing thing is the transport layer is html is http is these sets of protocols that allow us to use whatever we want allow us to rediscover things like sql like the gem that's been hidden in one corner of the development community for like 20 years and then suddenly another corner of the community goes like mm -hmm. what you got over there that's one mighty fine gem. Could I have a taste, please? <laughs> so I, I, I think one of my questions for you is how do you at this stage keep that, like, how do you keep that front of mind? Like you specifically, how do you keep like knocking down complexity? Because I feel like a lot of developers get sucked into the Borg where they'll go work for they'll go work for somebody doesn't matter who they'll go work for somebody and like you said the slice of the stack that they operate on is let's say javascript build that's it they don't do front end they don't do but they just do javascript building and here yeah. you are you know however many years into your career and you haven't been you know you you run your own thing which helps but you haven't been sucked into the borg of complexity. And I do feel like a lot of developers like to play with Legos, I think. And so they like to be like, hey, I'm going to put this together this way and do it again this way and just have fun focusing on that, which isn't inherently bad. But if you are trying to ship something to get paid and change your life, like, well, you should focus on that instead. So how do you specifically keep like hammering down the complexity? I keep thinking that what I'm doing now is going to blow up catastrophically. I don't keep thinking. I use it as a technique. This is called negative visualization and stoicism. Okay. I visualize that this thing I'm doing now is going to blow up catastrophically. And I don't know, there are companies go out of business all the time. It is the most common thing over the long run for a company to do. It is to go out of business. Very few companies are around for even five years, fewer mm -hmm. still 25 like we've had with 37 signals. We've been blessed with a very good run that could end at any moment. And what I think is, do you know what? I want to be prepared. I want to be hmm. prepared for the day where it's over. And the day it's over, I, I got to do something new. I got to start over from scratch. Hmm. And I want to be able to start over from scratch with these two devices, <laughs> these two hands. That's it. I want to be ca as capable, at least, not even as capable. I want to be more capable than I was in 2004 when these two hands created the technical infrastructure of mm. Basecamp and set things up in that way. So I'm constantly prepping. I, I don't mind borrowing that term. I am prepping mm -hmm. for the business 
apocalypse in my little world. Like it might be a broader sense of the world. Like there might be more things that go wrong at the same time. But I'm just going to be prepared for me. And I find such a satisfaction in knowing through both sort of trust in my own abilities, but also regular exercise of the <laughs> capacities that I have to build things with tiny, tiny teams. And when mm -hmm. I say tiny teams, I mean one person, two people, three at the most. Because mm -hmm. I can imagine in my head that if this thing goes bust, and for example, I go bankrupt, again, things happen all the time, people go bankrupt all the time. I gotta start over, I have no capital, I have no company, I have just what's in here and I got these two. What can I do? Can I get back? Can I, um, can I create things that are valuable and so forth? Um, I want to ensure that that's true because if I ensure that that's true, I can sleep so much better. I mean, in <laughs> itself, it's also enjoyable. I just like being capable and feeling capable mm -hmm. and building capacities and then obviously giving those to people who really do need it who literally don't have anything else than their, their head and two hands, that's really rewarding to see. Um, but it's also one of the things that allows me to look at my, my life's work, really, with mm -hmm. 37 Singles and go like, you know what? What a great run it's been. Hmm. But also, if it was over tomorrow, I'm not going to be shattered. I'm not going to be dispotent. I'm going to be capable. And like a week after you've nursed the wounds and licked your chops of this thing blowing up, all right, I'll get back to it. I'll build more stuff. And I'm not going to let the train get away from me because I've seen that. Mm. I've seen that when entrepreneurs where they've had a successful thing. And sometimes it's not even a catastrophe happen. It's a celebration. They sell their company. And now they're back at square one and they got to start over. And the train left their station. Like, uh. you feel like you're too far behind. Oh, I used to know the thing. Mm -hmm. I don't no longer know the thing. So now for me to even get started, I got to get a bunch of people. I probably got to get some investment because I'm not going to risk all my own capital, all these things. And I go like, oh man, no, I don't want that. Not I want my yeah. personal capacity to be intact. I want to be in shape. Hmm. I want to be in shape. We're like, if suddenly I got to start running away from a tiger. Um, <laughs> I, think, I don't know, maybe that's some um, DNA programming there, right? You got to like, do you know what? I, I could just get fat and lazy intellectually. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly if a uh, saber tooth shows up, I'm going to be screwed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, that is, I'll, I'll be honest. That is not where I expected you to go, but I, <laughs> I love it. That is amazing. Um, do you have, do you have time for like two or three more questions? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, yep. so you talked about, um, you'll have, you'll have to forgive me cause I'm not a rails developer. I'm a Laravel developer. So spiritually we're cousins, but I don't know the specifics. So you talked about solid queue, solid cash, and then you brought up, uh, Redis with their most recent, whatever they're doing. Um, is there any, are, does it already exist? Or are there any plans to drive any of the queuing or caching from SQLite as well? Cause that's something I'm looking at on the Laravel side. We have queue drivers that talk to the database and I'm thinking that would be great for a, a separate SQLite database. So it's not contentious, a separate one. And even like for caching, we could do something like that. So where are your thoughts on even further eliminating outside stuff? That's basically what we've done. So Great. SQL cache uh, or not SQL cache, solid cache mm -hmm. is using any active record compatible backend, cool. including SQLite as the uh, storage for caching. And this yeah. is straight out of the, how fast the storage become. It's become mm -hmm. fast enough now that the advantage RAM has does not actually matter in terms of the milliseconds in terms of serving the caches. And we did mm -hmm. a bunch of studying and tests on this um, cool. because one of the other advantages you get is not just comp complexion of, um, complexity in that you don't have to run a separate process. You also get more capacity. Like storage is still orders mm -hmm. of magnitude cheaper. So you get orders of magnitude more which means that let's say you're, you're starting a droplet here. It has two gigabytes of RAM. Yeah, but it might have 50 gigabytes of storage mm -hmm. or 100 gigabytes of storage. That's a lot of space you could store computation in since so you don't have to redo it. That's what C uh, solid cache is. And cool. 
I really want to set it up as the default out of the box for Rails 8 that Solid Cache is using SQLite by default, and exactly as you say, it's using a separate file so that you don't have to intermingle the caching stuff with the um, system of records stuff, yet you use the same kind of simplicity and you don't have to run a, a separate setup. And we're doing the same thing with Solid um, Job. So Solid Job is I the same it. thing. Yeah. Let's take... Uh, an infrastructure that very often ran against something like Redis. A lot of mm -hmm. job engines run against Redis or other in-memory stores. Let's point it to a database instead. It actually affords us a bunch of um, advantages. There's greater introspection. You can use mm -hmm. standardized tools with it. There's more space to do it. It has some other trade-offs in terms of um, sort of the operations of it. Um, and there, um, SQLite, it's perhaps a little bit behind. There's been some advantages or advances in Postgres and MySQL 8 forward that allowed some of the query structures you need for mm -hmm. a job engine to be a little more efficient. But at the low end, it also doesn't matter. Right. So at the very early stage, um, especially for experiments and, and small-scale deployments, you can still use the SQLite database as the back end for queuing and Solid job does that. So it's kind of a two pronged approach of trying to take two of the key components of a modern web application, caching mm -hmm. and job running, and say, do you know what? You don't need an in memory store to do that. You don't need Redis to do that. You can put that in the same database as you use for everything else, whether that's MySQL or SQLite with separate files. Man, I am so glad I asked. I love that so much. And I just want to like highlight that maybe five years ago, if you told someone on Hacker News you were using any database as a as a queue driver, they would be like, you're doing everything wrong. And now, not only are we doing it, we're pushing it all the way to SQLite, baby. It's it, We have come so far with the ability to, to use that kind of stuff. And I love it because Laravel uh, 11, the default driver for the database is now SQLite. And it just makes, like, it, it makes the onboarding story a lot easier. It's like, yes, you can if you need to, I don't know if you will, if you need to, you can graduate. Because a good thing about SQLite is everything you do there is probably gonna work in Postgres or MySQL. Maybe some finicky differences, but the ORM should abstract all of that away. But it gets you like, you can start and you're started. You don't have to spin up MySQL or Postgres or Redis or anything like that. So I do I do love to hear, I do love to that hear that. That was our been... early embrace in the Rails community. I forget when we did it, but this is many years ago now that SQLite became the default for Rails New. Hmm. Exactly for that reason, that you could do Rails New and you can start working without having to know the other stuff, without mm -hmm. having to know, oh, how do I set up MySQL and how do I, I do all these other things? Because I think uh, one of the things about com uh, conceptual uh, compression is that it benefits people who, are, who want to do it all, who want to be one, uh, one developer shops. They need to know a fair amount of things, but it also really benefits people who are just starting, who know nothing. Mm -hmm. Who, who more than anything just need a handful of success experiences yes. where they do stuff at the keyboard and stuff happens on the screen. And they go like, wow, I did that? I built that? I remember all the way back in ninth grade. This is 1994, I think. I went to this computer lab at a university that was connected to the internet. And you know what they sat us down to do? Not browse the internet. Make your own web page. Hmm. And... It had HTML open in this editor, and I did a little blink tag, and I saved, and I went to the browser, and like, holy shit, the text is blinking? Yeah. I did the blinking? I made a Life blink. Life-changing experience. Life-changing experience. And I think that's one of the things I'm really protective of mm -hmm. in the Rails setup, that we should give more people that life-changing experience. That doesn't mean that everyone who tries Rails will become a professional developer and so on, mm -hmm. but they will have an experience of power that I think is just invigorating for any human. Like, mm -hmm. I did a thing, a thing happened. That is really a gift to give to someone else. And SQLite is a huge help in that regard. Hmm. Yeah, not not everyone that sits down to do Rails News is going to be a professional developer, but it's not going to be because they couldn't get MySQL working or they couldn't get Postgres working. It might be for some other reason, which yes. is great. But it's not going to be because of that. Okay, last thing before I let you go. Y'all just launched or or teased or unveiled your new once.com product and it looks super interesting. I do a lot of writing myself and so I would love to hear you explain the vision um, for this new once.com product. 
Yes, so this is one number two. The first product was campfires we talked about. Um, that product was and is three ninety nine. Mm-hmm. This new product, and I'll put that in actually, I won't put it in quotation marks. It is a product. This is a product company making a product, but we're giving it away for free. So it's called Workbook, and okay. it is to solve a problem we've had where there's a lot of software on the internet that allows you to publish one page. Mm-hmm. You can push put it on Gist. You I write to hey world there's newsletters there's blogging things that's a very well served uh, domain not so well served is if you want to publish multiple pages that fit into a broader context what we usually call a book <laughs> here is a, a concept i want to explain to you for example and it's going to take like 90 pages Mm -hmm. Um, We've written a lot of books at 37 Signals, starting all the way back with Getting Real. Um, Actually, there was another book before that called Defensive Design. But if we take Getting Real, which was published on the internet, was self-published in 2006, it is exactly that kind of problem we want to make easier to solve. Because we were using, I think, four different kinds of platforms to create Mm -hmm. these kind of web books whether that is Getting Real, which is on gettingreal.basecamp.com, um, or our employee handbook, which also mm-hmm. is a book. It has, I don't know, 25 individual pages in it or something like that. Um, we've written a, a number of other books or manuals, really. We've written manuals for Kamal, our deployment tool, mm-hmm. or some of the Hotwire stuff. And like, it's all this stuff that's kind of convoluted to set up and it's kind of full of configuration and full of technical stuff. And we just go, why doesn't this exist as just a one package? One package, you put it, you install it, not a software as a service, right? Like maybe there are software as a service things that do this, but I'm not even interested in that. I'm not gonna run something like getting real on someone else's thing. Sure. I wanna publish for the internet on my own server because I know and trust that I can keep that running literally for decades, not gonna atrophy. But I want to make it easier. So that's what we've done uh, or are doing with Workbook. We're creating it. I think we have about seven books ourselves um, from getting real to work handbooks to internal manuals like um, our ops run book, our programmers book. We have a bunch of these internal uh, manuals. Some of them were also actually just kept in, uh, in GitHub as uh, mm-hmm. markdown files mm-hmm. and like we were using that to navigate around, which is actually a surprisingly capable solution mm-hmm. to do it with. A little janky, not so pretty, has some other drawbacks. But um, that's, that's the premise of Workbook. Make it easy to create books for the internet. Multiple pages that belong together and can be published in one location. We're gonna make it as a, just like we did Campfire, it's going to be a thing that's literally one command to run on your own server. You'll have work, workbook set up. You'll be able to lock straight in and, and do all your, your writing and, and set up for that. It just won't cost you anything. Mm-hmm. And it's source included. So just like with Campfire, we're mm-hmm. also giving the source away. I intentionally here don't say open source, even though I really like open source as a term, because we're not trying to start necessarily another community project where we're accepting Mm -hmm. pull requests and got to maintain that and so forth. And also because the thesis of once is finished software, Mm. not necessarily on day one, but that there is a principle of we can arrive at a finished piece of software that's just done. It does not need more features. It does not need more stuff. It may occasionally need a security update. Okay, fine. Um, that's great that you can still push mm-hmm. that up. But it's, it's conceptual sort of manifestation is done. Like it is, it's not going to have more buttons and more bells and more whistles. And Workbook hopefully can get there even quicker than Campfire get. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then we could give it away for free and it won't be a huge burden on us to maintain it, even though, of course, we will if there are issues with it. Um, and, and we are getting to build a bunch of novel, interesting tech for that as well. We're building a new text editor for Markdown Mm -hmm. called House. I just actually announced that today on on Twitter, Um, which is uh, something else than what we normally use in our products. We use a WYSIWYG editor Mm -hmm. called Tricks that we also build ourselves, and that's built into Rails through something called Action Text, so you can really easily get WYSIWYG editor set up with drag and drop and file upload and all these other stuff. But there's a bunch of especially technically minded people who don't like WYSIWYG. They mm-hmm. like Markdown. I'm one of those people. I really like mm-hmm. Markdown a lot for my own writing. 
and we're basically going to put that into this product and then also release that as an open source uh, gift to the world. So that's going to be workbook. Um, I don't have a specific launch date on it, but on once.com will be all the updates for uh, when that comes out. And you can, of course, also check out uh, Campfire in there. And um, we'll share as much of, as possible about that. I think the other thing that excites me about the whole Once brands is source included. Mm -hmm. Very often in the open source world, you can find a million source code examples for infrastructure software. Oh, you want to learn about how an object relational mapper is, is built? Great. There's, here's about 12 different repositories mm -hmm. you can dive in. You want to learn how a commercially resilient product is built? Oh, mm, no, sorry. Good luck. The vast majority of that is closed source. Mm -hmm. It is proprietary. I mean, the same with us. Hey and Basecamp, they're not open source. They, we don't have any plans to make those open source. Those are our, uh, sort of commercial trade secrets. I mean, mm -hmm. not really. But just this sense that uh, there is a plethora of open source software in, at the infrastructure level far, far less at the application level. And this is one of the things I really enjoyed with Campfire for um, customers who, who buy the product. They obviously, to get the source, we recorded uh, walkthroughs of mm -hmm. both the Ruby level and at the CSS level that people who, who buy Campfire get access to. And we could do more of that with Workbook because in part, there's no ticket fee. So someone could get at least that. I mean, Workbook is a substantially smaller product mm -hmm. than Campfire. It doesn't... Campfire is, um, is a very full-featured chat, and to build that in a modern, competitive, this could be a Slack alternative for some people way, is actually a substantial body of work. Workbook is a little more <laughs> modest in its ambitions. It doesn't mean it solves a, a, a problem that's necessarily less uh, modest or needed, but it just means that the technical scope of it is a little smaller. But anyway, I love open source. I love view source. I mean, I learned so much as we, as I said, um, my first experience with the internet, it was first making my own tag blink. And then it was literally going to, I think, yahoo.com or something and go view source. How did they do that thing? Mm -hmm. Oh, you can use a table and you can put little one by one spacer gifts in there to like align mm -hmm. things. Amazing, mind blown, right? Um, we don't have that these days on, for example, the front end. Far too many... Operations are using minification, obfuscation, web packing, chunking, ES building, just blobs, right? You get a blob. Oh, I'm going to request, um, or I want to learn how they built Gmail. Yeah, good luck sorting through 22 megabytes of obfuscated JavaScript. Mm -hmm. You're going to learn nothing with that. With Hey, for example, we did the opposite path. Hey is all no built on the JavaScript side, which means that all the individual files are just there. No mm -hmm. source map, mm -hmm. just readable as individual files. And Workbook and Campfire take that one step further. It's view source, but for the back end. Yep. I love that. I love I love that y'all are doing this source available thing. I love I think a lot of people bought Campfire just so they could look at how DHH codes a Rails app. I mean it's it's a great like it's a great learning experience and you know, I would buy if Taylor released something like that, Taylor Otwell, I would buy it in a heartbeat and just look at it and be like, oh, so that's how he does that kind of thing. And I think it's a great, it's Same. a great way to teach. It's wonderful. Same. I mean, there's all sorts of commercial software where I'd go like, I'd love to know how they built mm -hmm. that. Um, I wish I could do view source on a bunch of more stuff. Mm -hmm. So hopefully this can start at least on the front end. I kind of feel like it doesn't need much tipping there. This is the other reasons why I'm excited about node build and let's get away from all this uh, transpiler, compiler, mm -hmm. bunko jungle, um, because we can get back to view source. And at least that part of learning how the web works, you can learn how the web works by looking at successful, major mainstream things and realize, oh, it's actually not that complicated. Mm -hmm. The way they did that thing, oh, okay, yeah, I could do that too. Well, from SQLite to Stoicism to no build to losing everything in bankruptcy, this has been this has been a delight, and I can't express how grateful I am that you were like, yeah, let's do it right now. This is yeah. So I my just pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, and if people want to follow you, if they're somehow not following you already, um, I imagine Twitter slash DHH is probably the place to go. That's a great place. I took a bit of a break um, a few years back from Twitter, but now I'm, I was, again, I don't know how I feel about that. But now I'm back on Twitter and I do tweet a lot, but otherwise I have um, dhh.dk has links to both the Twitter and the LinkedIn Perfect. and all the other stuff in the books and whatnot in the products. 
Perfect. Well, thanks again, and we'll see you online. All right, thanks.